You're watching Seatome TV. Knowledge is power. What would you like people to most know about this? Um, well, there's a lot of information on lung cancer. Yes, um, I think, I think this has been a, um, you know, a real beacon disease for precision oncology. Hmm, There's that? been so much information and research and uh, new drug developments done in, in um, non-small cell lung cancers and lung cancers in general. Okay. We've seen a radical transformation. It used to be a very deadly disease. Now we're seeing, uh, you know, just incredible survival rates. Mm, that's exciting. Yeah, so I think, you know, if you do have cancer, uh, if you do have um, lung cancer, definitely there's a lot of hope. But the key really is precision oncology. Standard mm -hmm. chemotherapy is not the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, you need to really incorporate precision oncology and you know precision chemotherapy if if you uh, are doing chemotherapy. Right. You need to know the genetics. You need right. to know the molecular. There's features. too many things that can go wrong. There's so many positive variables mm -hmm. that can be incorporated into treatment. Mm. So really make ah, sure you get your way too many in. options way too many leaving options. off the table if you don't have that. And you know when I was when I was preparing for today's lecture, I just thought, okay, maybe I should just start with one mutation because there's so much mm. just on one mutation. Wow. But I thought, you know, we're going to do a bit of a brief overview and everything. But there's so many different studies. Well, you can so always come back and join me and talk about every single one of those. We mutations. would need a lecture every day for okay. an hour for a year. <laughs> okay. So, All right. so we'll dive right in. Yes. Um, so there's three different types, three main types. I'm not going to say there's only three different types because there's many variations of cancers. Um, but the three main types are adenocarcinomas, okay, in adenoid cells, uh, squamous cell carcinomas, and then there's also large cell carcinoma. And these okay. are all different subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer. Okay. Causes, smoking, number one cause, uh, radon exposure, uh, pollution, mm. you know, um, hydrocarbons, dust. What is radon? Radon is uh, naturally occurring radiation. Oh, okay. So where might I experience that if I'm out and about in the world? Um, well, there's radon maps. And so whenever you buy a place and you have a home inspection or you go live in an area, you always check to see if there's radon in that area. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. In, in fact, we had a case with a patient who, uh, who got cancer from, lung cancer from radon because they mm. were exercising in their basement. And? and they had radon there that they hadn't discovered at that time. Oh. Now, there were a bunch of other factors, too. Mm. It wasn't just the radon exposure, oh. but... Here they you, are you trying never, to do something good. Well, you never them. know what your genetics are. So, right. you know, you just want to avoid those things and you want to know if there's radon in your area. Right. And if there is, mm -hmm. get a radon detector. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's a bunch of factors. Yeah. So radon yeah. is a significant one. Okay. Pollution. All right. Uh, any chemicals that produce fumes. So paint, you know. Um, and smokes, like we were talking smokes, about earlier. Um, but just fumes from certain chemicals. Okay. Uh, obviously asbestos. Hmm. Like what about every now and then I'll put some nail polish on. Yeah. So, I guess it depends on the brand. Yeah, so and you want, to, you want to avoid that stuff, yeah. Mm. I mean, definitely um, uh, perfumes. Mm. You know, there's high, high rates of lung cancers in uh, perfume department salespeople. Seriously? Dry cleaning. Wow. You know, anything that, uh, anything that you're in an enclosed area with, you know, chemicals that are carcinogens. Mm. Hairsprays. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of... Um, a lot of hairdressers. Mm, um, right, but, yes. You know, we see that quite a bit. So those things could trigger any one of those three main types of non-small um, cell. Well, there's, it can obviously produce any type of, ca of lung cancer. Ah. And we're just focusing on three main types of non-small cell lung cancer. Okay, which were adenocarcinoma, squamous, squamous cell, and, and, and lung. Thank you. And then being overweight is a significant factor. Mm. And then diet. Mm. Having a poor diet is really huge. Mm. One of the biggest, this is one cancer that is really affected by diet. Isn't that interesting? The lungs. Yes. Oh. You'd think liver or something that processes. Yes, definitely. But, but diet. Yes, mm. yes. Okay. So prevention. How do you prevent it? Fruits. Okay. Huge one. Um, mm. It's one of the things we see a lot in... Um, 
uh, you know, in people that have that smoke and then also get cancer or lung cancer is they have they, they don't like fruits and vegetables, mm. you know. And this is so typical. I hear this all the time. Mm. We'll speak to patients and we'll say, um, you know, so what's your diet like? Oh, my diet's great. Okay, well, here's the foods that will prevent your cancer. Oh, I hate all of those foods. <laughs> and here's the foods that will cause your cancer. Oh, I love those foods. <laughs> it's just classic. <laughs> You know, uh, and so if you have I, the information, teach yourself to like the foods that are going to prevent the cancers mm -hmm. you don't want to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or maybe find ways like, um, you know, shakes or Make you know, it interesting. supplements yeah. or something like that yeah, to exactly. get, get them in easily. Exactly. So fruits and vegetables, sure. huge preventative factors there. Okay. Berries, probably one of the biggest factors in preventing lung cancers is berries. Mm. And um, we went over phase one and phase two enzymes, but I think we should probably do a video just on that alone. <laughs> Um, so, as you know, berries um, inactivate, they have these plant phytochemicals um, that are able to inactivate uh, the damage done by uh, free radicals, and free radicals are caused by the breakdown of many carcinogens mm -hmm. and uh, xenobiotics, as we call them, drugs and so on. Um, anything with a hydrocarbon ring um, can be broken down into a epoxide, which is uh, very damaging to DNA and causes mutations. Mm -hmm. And so berries increase the level of phase two enzymes, which help break down this hypo um, epoxide intermediate. Mm -hmm. So that's an important, um, important thing. Um, fresh herbs are important. Uh, daily exercise. Mm -hmm. And the latest one is yogurt and fiber together. Mm -hmm. So this once again is, is opening up the door to this fascinating area of research called the microbiome mm. and once again a highly diverse microbiome is very protective against diseases like heart disease and cancers mm -hmm. but specifically with cancers and a less diverse uh, microbiome um, is going to be uh, causative and create or you know creates a lot of processes that leaves you more vulnerable leaves you very sensitive mm -hmm. to cancer development mm -hmm. and so a recent study um, looked at yogurt and fiber because yogurt is a source of uh, probiotics and so when you combine yogurt the source of probiotics mm -hmm. with fiber mm -hmm. which is the food of probiotics um, um, bacterial diversity really likes fiber okay. and it seems to um, I'm not sure of the exact mechanism hmm. but um, it seems to be something that really promotes bacterial diversity, mm. species diversity. Mm. And so this combination of yogurt and fiber actually reduced the risk of lung cancer by 33%. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, that's huge. 33%. 33% reduced risk of lung mm. cancer. And that's in smokers and people at risk. Wow. So just, so nothing else, just adding more fruit, um, yogurt with fiber. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wow. Yogurt so I might have some, so I might have some toast and uh, and some yogurt and, and that's yogurt, my so the yogurt, or fruit because so, fruit has so fiber. So the yogurt with berries and uh, bran and fiber breakfast or granola kind of thing or granola breakfast yeah. you know porridge breakfast thirty three percent so reduction I, in your chance and of so lungs. interesting enough that's kind of uh, a diet that we see a lot of in people that do smoke a lot and don't eat or don't yeah. get cancers for right. a long time. So maybe that's what Winston George Churchill, Burns, George Burns. Burns. <laughs> we never know. You never okay. know. Okay. Yes. Okay, so fresh herbs, the berries, the yogurt and fiber, and tell us about exercise. Exercise is very important, as you know. Um, mm. it, it, uh, we've gone over that many times. We've gone over the mechanisms, and we should probably do a 10-minute series just on how exercise benefits patients sure. and cancer. So okay. I don't think we have time for that today. All right. Do you, uh, what I was actually asking was a very brief uh, snippet from you about uh, the types of exercise that somebody who wants to help prevent lung cancer Resistance might want. Resistance training. Resistance yeah. training. Okay, so weight bearing weight exercise. Bearing exercise. Yeah, okay, resistance is more bad. important than cardio for yes. something like that. Yes, definitely. Okay, all right. So you can sit there, you can watch your TV or your Netflix at night, and be doing some push ups, push -ups squats, sit ups, anything. squats, a yes. little bit of free weights, yes, and helping yourself prevent lung cancer. Yes, yes. So now we're going to go into the fascinating world of lung cancer treatment. Okay, and just where things are at right now. Yeah, it sounds really exciting. So when I hear from patients with lung cancer, you know, the first thing I ask them is, 
what have you been tested for? And they said, oh, well, my doctor tested me for EGFR and I don't have the mutation. Mm. And I'm like, oh. mm. we have eight molecular targets right now, if not nine molecular targets for lung cancers. Mm. That not, means not just EGFR. Exactly. Right. Not so. So what that means is you must get tumor DNA sequencing. You want to know what your targets are. You have to know that mm -hmm. information. It's so important. So if your oncologist tests you for one mutation, that's lovely, yeah. but it's not sufficient. You need to get it. If you have, if you have lung many. cancer, invest in tumor DNA mm -hmm. sequencing. Because you can look at, uh, up, uh, right now, some very uh, excellent tests are giving you between 350 to 550 yeah. molecular targets. That's a lot of yeah, information. And, and for lung cancer, you just need to know uh, whether... It covers these eight targets that we're going to discuss today. Okay. So the first target, EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor. Mm -hmm. This was um, the poster boy for precision oncology. Mm. Um, it was one of the first uh, molecularly targeted mutations. Mm. That and her too. Mm. Um, no. So what this was, um, this created the development of the NIBs. The NIBs are referred to as tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Okay. So with HER2, that was the development of the monoclonal antibodies, Herceptin. Mm -hmm. And for EGFR, that was the development of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Okay. And so the first two tyrosine kinase inhibitors were allotinib and gefitinib. Okay. They were both um, considered, and they've been around for quite a while. Um, and they've, they radically changed how people with EGFR mutated lung cancers responded. Mm. It, it doubled their survival in some cases. Mm. Um, now, these are what we call reversible inhib inhibitors. And so they inhibit, but um, their inhibition can be reversed. And they often, patients often became um, you know, resistant to these treatments after a few years of being on the drug. Mm. While it did provide many years of cancer-free um, life for patients with EGFR mutations, um, there's a series of mutations that um, actually cause these drugs to stop working. Mm. And these are what we call emerging mutations okay. or mutations in other genes. So they either come out over the course of your cancer treatment? Yeah, in response emerging? to the treatment, believe it or not, okay. that, that we believe. All right. so, the, so, the rem so the mechanisms to these, so these are called reversible inhibitors. So the mechanisms of resistance to these reversible inhibitors are um, copy number variations, that means um, multiplications, multiple copies of a gene called MET, CMET, and then also in the IGF, IR genes. Okay. Or insulin like growth factor 1 receptors. Okay. And then also p uh, mutations in the P10 tumor suppressor gene and the mTOR signaling pathway. And then also there's what we call secondary mutations in the EGFR gene. So, allotinib Whoa. and gefitinib work specifically for um, certain mutations in EGFR. That's a lot of information that you need to know just for one gene, yeah. especially when there can be many. We haven't involved. even started. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hang on. So, so what happens um, in these patients is they develop mutations in P10, mTOR, EGFR, other, other mutations in the EGFR, or even HER2. And HER2, as you know, is common in breast cancer. HER2, mm. well, HER2 positive breast cancers. So there's also um, a new mutation called an emergent mutation in the EGFR um, that was called the T790M. And what happens is when these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, when they bind um, the EGFR gene, uh, the receptor, um, when they bind it, what they do is they cause it to not or they, they prevent the signaling of it as it's using the cell. Mm. So when you get an EGFR T790 emerging mu uh, mutation, what happens is it causes a kink in the receptor. So those other drugs can't actually bind it anymore. Mm. So it, it creates this um, physical barrier to these reversible inhibitors oh, from working. Oh, I see. Yeah. And is that reversible? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Oh. Well, I'm just thinking if these things kind of, if they come up in kind of response to treatment, is that if I stop the treatment, will I be able to use them again later? That's an interesting question. 
So um, I didn't even think of discussing that, but oh. you're opening up a whole new area of research. <laughs> oh, okay, later, another time. Um, well, just to just to give you a summary of, of what you just um, uh, were, were basically a new field of study alluding to. Mm -hmm. You didn't create it. I'm kidding. Of alluding course. to um, is basically what happens is you have this subset of different populations of cells. So you don't actually, um, so there's two, diff two different things that can happen when you become resistant to this. Mm -hmm. A new population of cells develops this T790M mutation. It's not necessarily the old ones. So, mm. <clears throat> so there will still be, your previous cells will continue to respond to allotinib and gefitinib. It's just that this new subpopulation mm -hmm. of cells that are driven by a secondary EGFR mutation are now taking over. And so this is called a um, emerging mutation. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of microevolution. Mm. So that's what you're referring to. So, you know, a lot of doctors will say, well, you're not responding to the EGFR inhibitor anymore. Mm. We're just going to take you off it. And that's a bad mistake mm. because you are still responding to it. It's just that you have a new population of cells that is not responding to it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's kind of what you were insinuating. Right. And so, how would I know? Well, you can assume that you're still going to be... Um, preventing certain cells from arising, um, the way to get, so unfortunately, the way they test for EGFR T790M mutations is they look at the biopsy, but really that's not the way to go because it's an emerging mutation. Right. It's going to happen in a very small population of cells, right. and you may just pick a biopsy that doesn't have that. And it may not be in all of the cells in that biopsy. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we use liquid biopsies. Mm -hmm. And it's the only way to effectively tell if you have an EGFR mm -hmm. T790M mutation. So blood-based test. Blood-based. Mm -hmm. And this is true for all of the other emerging mutations. We always use a blood-based test. Mm -hmm. We have um, exosome-based testing for MET mutations, mm -hmm. um, for you know P10, EGFR, HER2. We look at HER2 copy number variation. Um, we, you know, there's all kinds of things we can do with liquid biopsies. Mm -hmm. To because keep an eye on any changes. Because they're so sensitive, biopsy. they look at the entire system. They don't just look at a biopsy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, those two drugs were what we call first-generation EGFR inhibitors. Okay. Um, then they came out with a second-generation inhibitor called afatinib. Um, now, this is irreversible. And interesting enough, it also targets HER2 as well as EGFR. Hmm. So this came out just after allotinib and gefitinib. Um, and it's a, you know, it was a drug that doctors would typically give once patients got, became uh, resistant to allotinib and gefitinib. Now, they would often give this drug without actually determining what the mechanism of resistance was. Right. We would definitely look at the mechanism, mechanism of resistance and then target that, That's a, rather than just giving a new drug. What you just said is a really crucial point because mm -hmm. there's a lot there there's a lot of confusion out there among uh, oncologists and even researchers as to how effective certain treatments are based on just that exactly, thing exactly that they weren't monitoring the proper mutations to be able to tell why mm -hmm. a treatment did or didn't work for somebody and instead just assumed, oh, well, that's not as effective. It's actually called a lack of patient stratification. Okay. And uh, interesting enough, when Lotinib and Gefitinib first came out, there was this big clinical trial where they took all of these patients with lung cancers and they gave them these drugs. And both drugs failed. Mm. And so then, you know, the doctors were like, well, wait a minute, these drugs don't work on lung cancer patients. They failed the statistical averages. Mm. So some of the scientists looked at it and they said, well, wait a minute. You weren't testing these patients to see if they had EGFR mutations. You just randomly took non-small cell cancer mm. patients. Mm. So they went back over it and they found that the patients that did respond in these trials had these EGFR mutations mm. and the ones that didn't, didn't. Mm -hmm. And so that was the big lesson of precision oncology. You know, patient stratification mm -hmm. so important. Mm -hmm. And today, people still forget these important lessons we learned from the Iressa and um, Tarceva trials. Well, and what you mean in this case, with precision oncology, what you mean by patient stratification is the molecular profiling. Exactly, and the continual molecular profiling mm -hmm. using liquid biopsies and new technologies right. to detect these emerging mutations and treat the emerging mutations while still maintaining treatment that is effective for the original mutations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. getting all of the populations right. of cells, yeah. not just so one. this is really new. 
So there's a drug called Tegriso that came out. Mm. And actually, we had one of the first patients in Canada on Tegriso mm -hmm. a few years ago. We've been following it for quite a while. Tegriso was designed to target the T790M mutation. Mm. And mm. so obviously, this is you know a huge breakthrough. So when we first started seeing this drug about three years ago, we tried to get all of our patients in the trials, and we had some phenomenal results. Patients that had stopped responding after four or five years on a lot of image of fitinib, all of a sudden they started responding again. Now we did check our patients to make sure that the that the reason they were becoming resistant to these treatments was T790M. Mm -hmm. So we made sure we stratified those patients. Mm -hmm. Some of those patients did not have that mutation and they had other mutations like MET or P10 or mTOR or HER2. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, different we would give drug. them different drugs. Mm -hmm. But in the cases of Tegriso, it was an amazing, amazing drug. Mm. So Tegriso wow. was actually approved in Canada in January um, of 2018. Surprisingly, a lot of doctors still do not know about it. Uh, we had this terrible case last year. Um, and so Tegriso is actually approved for first-line metastatic um, EGFR positive lung cancer. Now, now Tegriso is an ir irreversible, but it's also what we call irreversible and selective. So while afatinib is irreversible, the problem with afatinib and allotinib and gefitinib is they don't just bind the mutated EGFR, but they bind the healthy, normal version of it. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you get side effects. Yeah. Because EGFR is very important in skin, mm -hmm. and all of your organs have skin, and skin is all over your body. So if you suppress EGFR, the wild-type version of it, mm -hmm. that's in your healthy cells, you're going to have some side effects. Mm -hmm. And so efatinib obviously has more side effects because it binds more targets, and it's irreversible unlike um, the lots of image of fitinib. And remind me again what irreversible means. Well, that means case. once it binds onto that, that um, uh, protein, it does not release. Okay, got it. Okay, and the Tegriso? Tegriso is irreversible, but it's also selective. So it's selective for the T790M mutation. Which you don't It's need. not just random, right? right which, okay. is the, which is the emerging cancer-causing mutation. Okay, so so, awesome. so the Aurora 3 trial really showed the benefit of that. And so for patients that have become resistant and had multiple treatments, these are patients that are being treated in the second and third line of treatment, mm -hmm. where chemotherapy is completely useless. And obviously the EGFR and the fatidin is not working anymore. These patients were typically sent off to die. With Tegriso, 66% uh, of those patients got a response in their second and third line. These are patients that have had a lot of treatment right. and have heavy metastasis mm -hmm. all over their body. Mm -hmm. um, more importantly, the progression-free survival for these patients was, was almost 10 months. Mm. And the overall survival, um, on, and that's the average, the median overall survival was 27 months. It was 26.8 months to be wow, exact. Wow, almost three more years. Almost three, yeah, two. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm exaggerating ever so slightly. My math is Over off. two. Okay, just over but, two. But you made a good point there because the confidence, the 95% confidence interval for this study, and so that that is the range. So the average, 50% of the patients live 26.8 months. Mm. However, some, some patients, patients live a little less, and, and some, some patients, patients live more. And, and some, some of the patients that live longer are still cancer-free to this day. Wow. So they were literally cured. So, so you, you have, have this range with an average yeah. of, of you know, 27 months. Some, some patients didn't live that long, probably because they, they didn't have the T790M mutation, or they had these other emerging resistance mutations. And then the patients that did respond did really well. Wow. And, and so, so uh, at, at, 12 and 14, at 12 and 24 months, the overall survival was 80% at 12 months and 56% uh, at uh, 24 months, wow. which is huge. It is when you think that you've already gone through two or three types of treatment, you've been yeah. told, you know, that's pretty much it. It's death uh, And then here's this thing that's just wiping it out. And up. what they found out, too, is that not only is degree so effective at a late line, because this is what they usually do, use these drugs for. They start out with the late line. They found out that it's incredibly effective when you first start treatment. Mm. So, and if you it, can, so if you know your molecular drivers of your cancer before yes. you start treatment, yes, you get exactly. the right stuff right exactly. from the start. So it was approved in 2018 in Canada. Mm. Very few doctors took it up. 
Um, and so that means it's available in the U.S. if that's where you're watching yes. from, and you can get oh, it elsewhere around the world. Yes, definitely. But definitely. So we had a very sad case of a patient mm -hmm. that was diagnosed just last year. In, um, they were diagnosed, I think, in... Uh, we saw them in April, I believe. Okay. You know? um, and so they were on allotinib. Mm -hmm. And so I asked, the, you know, I asked the doctor, I said, why are you not on Tegriso? It's free. The, you know, the drug company is providing it for free. And it you know, has a much longer survival rate. Plus, it also takes care of this T790M resistance mutation. And you know, it has less side effects. It's, it's such a great drug. Why are you using allotinib? He says, well, I didn't know it was available. So, unfortunately, we went back and we tried to get the patient on it because they had stopped responding to a lot of it. And um, the indication was for first line. So, since they've already been treated, mm. they were not allowed this drug. Mm. Not, uh, not, not, not covered under not public covered health care. They public could have got a hold of it. They could have paid for it out of pocket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, that was a very sad situation. That is very sad. The patient because ended that up was, dying. That right there is one of those cases that I talk about a, a lot, which mm -hmm. is where because that information bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Too much information coming out yeah. right now all the time about go with what new treatments. The oncologists can't keep up, yeah. so they're not going to be able to know all Definitely. the bits and pieces. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so we have another drug, another player called dacomedinib. It's another tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, that was approved in 2018, I believe, summer, September. Okay. Um, and so that is a, another selective and irreversible inhibitor, but it, instead of just targeting EGFR, it also targets um, HER2 and HER4, oh. which are both resistance mechanisms. Oh. So it covers a lot of bases. Yeah, a lot of bases, yes, oh. definitely. So we'll leave EGFR alone for now. Sure. Um, but there's just some amazing developments in it. That's great. Um, so now there's also BRAF, which is common in melanoma, okay. BRAF mutations. There's two drugs for that called venurafenib and dabrafenib. Um, you know, they're getting great results. So if you have uh, BRAF, positive uh, non-small cell lung cancer, um, you know, you can use these two treatments. Mm -hmm. um, and then KRAS. KRAS is a, has been a big problem for many, many years. Mm. Um, and that's because KRAS is, was considered not druggable. It was, you know, one of these first oncogenes. Seem where they to be found. resistant to... Yeah, it's just really hard to drug it. Mm. And, and that's because mm. of the shape of the protein. Mm. Um, it's, it doesn't have a lot of accessible points where the drug can go in and bind and alter it. So recently, um, there's been an amazing new development of a type of drug called a small molecule inhibitor. Mm. Now, I remember first learning about small molecule inhibitors way back in uh, you know, 2000. Um, they were just used in the lab and they didn't have any application. But um, we discussed tyrosine kinase inhibitors briefly. Um, so this new drug um, for KRAS, they're able to target it. They tried targeting it with t um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors but it didn't work. Um, so they now have this new drug that targets KRAS mutations um, uh, using a small molecule inhibitor. I think probably what we should do is talk a little bit about tyrosine kinase inhibitors versus small molecule inhibitors. I think we should probably do a little video segment on that alone, but I think I'm just going to briefly go over the difference here. So, so basically, when a protein, like an oncogene that causes cancer, is activated, it's activated by a process called phosphorylation. A phosphate group is added to the uh, protein. Okay. Now, TKIs, these drugs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, can interfere with these uh, signaling pathways in four different ways. Mm -hmm. Number one, they can compete with what's called the ATP uh, binding pocket. Mm -hmm. And that's where the phosphorylation happens. It happens at this place called the ATP. Okay. And so, as you know, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It is the, um, it is basically the currency of all living creatures. Mm. It's only made by plants. It's not made by humans. But what humans do is they get it from other species by eating those species and they can recharge it. And what they do, and so our entire me metabolism, everything we do is based on adding a phosphate group to adenosine mono or diphosphate or adding two phosphate groups to adenosine triphosphate. And we do that through the foods we ingest. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. And we have to ingest it. So um, we actually, no, we gain our ATP, right, our ADP and, and so on from the foods we ingest. We recharge it. 
So when you activate something, you spend, it's like, think of a bank account. ATP is, ATP is a full bank account. When you, when you leave it, when you take a phosphate off and recharge a molecule, activate a signaling pathway, then you now have ADP. So you've lost that phosphate. So that's like making a withdrawal. Mm -hmm. If you do it again, then you've lost two phosphates. And now you're kind of getting into the red, you're getting into your bank overdraft. Mm -hmm. So you have to go to work and you have to add some more money to that <laughs> account. And that's, you recharge by adding a phosphate group to, to a AMP, and that causes it to become ADP, diphosphate. And then you add another one and it's called ATP. And that's what our whole respiration system of, of food does is it recharges ATP. Okay. So so we use up ATP and then we recharge it. Makes and sense. so activating one of these signaling pathways uses ATP. Okay. And so what tyrosine kinase inhibitors do, one of the ways they can do this is they can interfere with that addition of the phosphate group. Mm -hmm. So you know they can compete for that AT they compete for that location on the protein with the ATP molecule. So all of a sudden, the ATP molecule can't go there and bind it. Got it. Right. Um, you can also interfere. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors also work by interfering with the substrate. That means whatever molecule is, is uh, you know, attached to that signaling pathway. Mm. Or tyrosine kinase inhibitors can work on both pathways. They can interfere with ATP and the substrate. Or they can also, um, the fourth way they work is through a system called allosteric um, inhibition. And so basically what they do is they occupy a site on the protein that causes the protein to change its conformation and that change in conformation prevents the ATP from binding and activating it. Wow. So this is the different ways that tyrosine kinase inhibitors work and each one works slightly differently. So it's important to know if, you're, if you have a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, it's important to know how they work and which one is best for you. Right. Now in all cases, what tyrosine kinase inhibitors do is they, they, they lead to a process called ubiquitination. And you, ubiquitination is basically a process where a protein or a, you know, the product of a gene or an enzyme is tagged for degradation. Mm. And so when something is ubiquitinated, it's a little a tag and it says throw this in the garbage. Right. It's dragged over to what we call proteasomes and the proteasomes break it down and recycle everything. Mm. So in all cases, that's how these tyrosine kinase inhibitors work. Yeah. So these did not work for KRAS, but a small molecule inhibitor that actually goes in and binds it, and we won't get into small molecule inhibitors right now because it's a much more complicated process, okay. um, but these small molecule inhibitors, because they're so small, they're able to enter the cells freely, and they're able to enter the cancer cells, and so therefore something like pancreatic cancer is going to respond much better to it. Sure. So we have hope for that. Yeah. So in a very recent study, just in last year's ASCO, just a few months ago, um, they presented this drug called AMG510, a small molecule inhibitor for, um, for the uh, KRAS G12C mutation. Okay. Wow. And I'm getting pretty specific. Yeah, isn't it? incredibly specific. So KRAS G12C it occurs in probably ten or eleven percent of non-small cell lung cancers. So it's it's a good drug or it's a good target. Um, and these they gave it to a bunch of patients that are really sick. They've been through a lot. Um, in fifty fifty six percent of the patients, they had a disease control rate of a hundred percent. 56% of those patients, 100%. Wow. And in 54% of those patients, they achieved the partial response. That means some of their tumors, this is based on the recess criteria, mm -hmm. some of their tumors responded, you know, some of them didn't. And then 46% of those patients achieved stable disease while on the drug. So this is a new horizon wow. in the treatment of cancer. But it goes to show how what when you when you can drill down like you can with this genetic testing that's mm -hmm. available now mm -hmm. and you can find out what's driving someone's cancer yeah. and if you keep an eye on it with those liquid biopsies yes. so you see kind of what's what's, what's uh, emerging on? mutations as yeah. you're going 56% yeah. of this one group had a 100% response. Yes. That's amazing. It is, for, for such late stage. And, and wow. KRAS-driven um, KRAS lung cancers are really tough to treat. 
Wow. They don't respond to EGFR inhibitors. They don't respond yeah. to immunotherapy. That's great. So this is, uh, you know, a new horizon. Yeah. So I envision, wow. you know, within the next few years, you'll go in with your seeking, sequencing results. Uh, you know, the doctor will say, okay, let's see your sequencing results. You have, uh, you know, KRAS G12D. You have a BRAF V600A. You have this, 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 this. Um, come back in three months and we'll have a drug cocktail that's perfect for you. Well, hopefully it won't be three months. Well, I understand what you're doing. It'll be three months. Okay, I'm sorry. I picked up on the wrong point there. The point is... Okay, this took 30 years. Okay, all right. I'm just saying it. I want my treatment now. I don't want to wait three months. But, okay, you're... You see where we're going with this. I do. The fundamental point is... It, uh, it's going to be very like precision, r true precision You're oncology, really, really very personalized some cancer amazing care. things. Yes, yeah. yeah. And so now we'll get into um, some of the other recent. And um, now these are not so recent; they've been around for a while. But we also have uh, drivers of cancer um, um, called ALK, ALK, ROS1, mm -hmm. which is, refers to reactive oxygen species. Um, uh, the ALK is an anaplastic lymphoma kinase. I, I don't remember all of these, but the, the, then there's MET-driven cancers. And then there's another one, uh, NRTK1. Uh, yeah, NRTK1. And so these are all mutations um, that are found in various patients that now have drugs and very, very effective drugs. So you want to make sure your doctor is testing or the these are on your tumor DNA sequencing panel. Mm -hmm. And so one of the drugs, uh, seritinib, um, targets ALK. It's very effective. Um, electinib targets ALK. Now, once again, these are all tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So they're kind of old school, mm. <laughs> but they've been around for, you know, a few years. Okay. Then you have brigatinib, which targets ALT and ROS1. Then there's lorlatinib, and that targets uh, ALK and, and ROS1 too. And then there's a new one, crizotinib. Um, well, it's not that new, but it, it targets ALK, MET, and ROS1. And then we also have uh, a very new one, which is really exciting. It's called entrectinib. And it targets ALK, ROS1, and NRTK1 to 3. So, you know, regardless of whether you have one or two or a combination of these mutations, there's a drug for you. And then that's why you're calling it exciting, really, yeah. is because there's so, so many options. Yes, totally. You have those mutations. Totally, yes. Yeah. yeah. And something that you said earlier, you kind of skimmed over it, but it's mm -hmm. a really important point, which is that these types of treatments typically provide patients with a, a hugely mm -hmm. significant mm -hmm. benefits with fewer side yeah. effects. Yeah. And a lot of these drugs, um, not all of them, you have to look at each specific drug, um, can pass the blood-brain barrier. Mm. And so they can treat CNS metastasis, mm. which is really important in lung cancer. Mm. That's good so now we need to get onto some other drugs. And of course, you know, the biggest breakthrough in any, any kind of cancer is always going to be immunotherapy. Mm. And lung cancer was pretty well a second cancer that um, was the target of immunotherapy. Mm. Okay. So... We'll get into that in a second, but first I just want to mention a drug that we use a lot of. It's called zoledronic acid. It's also known as Zometa. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bisphosphonate. It's a very powerful bisphosphonate. It's very cheap. You get it once every three months. It's um, used for osteoporosis. It's called Zometa? Zometa. Zometa. Yes. Okay. Um, it's known as zoledronic acid. Okay. Um, and so we give it to patients with breast cancer and prostate cancer. Uh, it's very cheap. It's about, you know, six, seven hundred dollars a year. Unfortunately, it's not covered um, here in BC. In BC, mm. they cover some of the lesser forms of bisphosphonates that are not as effective as Zometa. Mm. But an interesting study in Zometa and lung cancer, we've been using it in lung cancer for probably eight years now. Um, this study showed that although this drug is involved in um, preventing osteoporosis in women that are on anti-estrogen therapy. It also has cancer-fighting activity. Mm -hmm. And so in lung cancer, it actually increases survival time to 385 days in this subgroup of patients uh, versus 275 days. So these are, you know, late-stage patients that um, 
you know, didn't have any treatment options, didn't have any targeted therapies. Mm. And so uh, their doctors just gave them Zometa alone. Mm. And, and I think they may have had some, you know, capacitivine, palliative chemotherapy. Mm. So these are palliative patients. But, you know, added well over 100 days to their life. Mm. So, you know, wow. that was quite significant. But more importantly, it lowered the incidence of malignant pleural effusion. And that is a real problem with lung cancers. And that's where the, um, the pleural, the, the lining of the lungs um, gets inflamed and um, gets fluid in it. And it can be very, very painful. It can, yeah. causes breathing problems. And obviously, it leads to death in many cases. Uh, makes you susceptible to pneumonia, yeah, infections, infections yes. all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Um, mm -hmm. So it actually reduced the incidence of that in so, these patients. So, in so is that for these late stage patients? This is for anyone. Anyone, we, okay. we, anyone who's on lung cancer, we always suggest getting zometa, zometa or zolidromic yeah, acid because it's got literally no side effects and it's right. so cheap. And it's inexpensive. Inexpensive. Okay. You get a shot every three months. So even if you're very late stage, it'll help you somewhat. But yeah, but, uh, days. but uh, otherwise, as a lung cancer patient, it'll make it, you less susceptible to certain infections. Yeah, malignant pleural mm -hmm. infusion and and you know, water in the lining of your lungs. Yeah. Or fluid. Wow, that's yeah. exciting. Very, so that's a simple, simple, that's simple what, fix. Now, is that what is referred to as an off label? Yes, that's an off label treatment? approach. So yeah. something that was created for something else, but exactly. happens to have this exactly. benefit. Yeah. yeah. So we, we spent mm -hmm. a lot of time on that. So it's not even considered a cancer drug. Right, but it makes a big Designed difference for osteoporosis, to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get into immunotherapy very briefly okay. because uh, if you look at the numbers of the uh, immunotherapy trials, you'll see we're getting into the hundreds for the different drugs. Wow! So one hundred different types of immunotherapy. Uh, no, no, I will explain that in a minute. Okay, hundreds of clinical trials. Yes. Okay. Hundreds of clinical trials. Yes. So immunotherapy, um, what we know, indicators for response to immunotherapy, and we always look at prognostic features and indicators of response. Okay. Um, one of the things that seems to really be an effective guide for immunotherapy in lung cancer, and this seems to apply to all types of lung cancers, is high PD-1 expression. So if you have over 50%, you're going to have a great response to immunotherapy. Oh. Um, even, you know, 1 to 49 percent, you're going to have a good response. Now, the problem is, is PD-1 is often determined using biopsies. Mm. Not a good way to do it because um, there's a lot of discordance between biopsies. Right. So, um, we recommend that you look, if you're going to do PD-1 testing and you're not going to look at the blood and do a liquid biopsy, then you need to look at four separate biopsies. Oh, because wow. there's going to be a lot of variation between those. So right. one biopsy, one you know, one biopsy may have um, mm -hmm. low PD-1, and all of a sudden your doctor is saying, "Well, you got low PD-1. We're not going to give you immunotherapy." Right. And then another one may have high PD-1. So you have to look at at least four different biopsies. Okay. But most people don't have four biopsies. No, I know, and that's no. a bit of a problem. In which case, it, because immunotherapy can be so incredibly beneficial if you have PD-1. Uh, you want to definitely have a blood-based test yeah, for that. Then. Yeah. And 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 the uh, um, tissue-based too as well. Okay. You want to look at it from different angles. All right. So um, another thing that determines whether these uh, immunotherapy works well in lung cancer patients is your MSI status, your MMR. And we discussed that in last week's immunotherapy. So MSI is microsatellite instability, and MMR is mismatched repair. Interesting enough, being an ex-smoker is a good prognostic feature for immunotherapy. And that's probably because all of the different uh, mutations that smoking causes really make the cells stand out to the immune system. Mm. So, you know, smoking you know, has a lot of carcinogens, and so it really damages the DNA oh. in your cells. And so that's going to be much easier to recognize. Wow. By the so when you system. boost the immune system with immunotherapy, it's going to find those. And it's going to have an easier time of, of recognizing mm -hmm. and discerning what's a cancer cell and what's not. It's not a good reason to start smoking. No. <laughs> now, uh, interestingly enough, tumor mutation burden, in other words, the amount of mutations, mm -hmm. at this time, you know, we originally thought it was going to be a, you know, a great tool for every cancer. 
But for some reason, lung cancer is not a good, not the best indicator. Not a good indicator. No, yeah. and that's probably because in the study that looked at tumor mutation burden, there's a lot of variation in how they determine tumor mutation burden, and then they didn't necessarily stratify for these specific yeah. mutations. Mm -hmm. So, whether it is or not a factor, we don't know yet. Yeah, um, it, the data is saying no, and obviously we have to go with data, but. You have to stratify too. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the different mutations. So MSI and MMR are good are indicators good. Yeah, good for this indicators, type of yeah. cancer, but and, not and those for tumor mutations. Yeah, so those are a type of, you know, MMR is mismatch repair. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a type of gene involved in DNA repair. Mm -hmm. So I just want to briefly talk about some of the new combination therapies. Um, and so Keynote 189. We started with Keynote 1. That was the first oh. immunotherapy trial. Wow. And so Keynote 89 is just another one in the Keynote studies. Okay. Okay. There's many Keynote studies. 189 of them. No, there's more than that. Oh. This is just Keynote 189. Okay. So this protocol um, has been around for a while. We started this a few years ago. And now um, we're happy to say that we're seeing a few patients in Canada that are getting it. Hmm. Um, it's not consistent across everyone. Um, it's FDA approved and it should be given to everyone right off the bat, first line. Mm -hmm. um, it's approved for first line metastatic non squamous and for patients that don't have EGFR or ALK mutations. Okay. Doesn't mean that it's not going to benefit those patients, it just means this is a limited approval and uh, this is one thing that really bothers me is these limited approvals. Mm. Um, it just It's like a way of weeding out patients and saying, sorry, you know, we don't want to take a chance on you. But isn't it? Isn't that because of the lack of patient stratification you were talking yes, about, right? Is. They don't it know really how to is. tell for sure if it's going to work, exactly. and budget's tight, sadly, yeah. for healthcare. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. great trial. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few patients on this right now. Um, so, it basically combines uh, an old immunotherapy drug, literally the second immunotherapy drug ever designed, pembrolizumab, um, it was considered the second generation, and nivolumab was like the first, and pembrolizumab was the second. Pembrolizumab targets both the receptor and the ligand, the PD-1 receptor and the ligand. Um, and so when you add that to standard chemotherapy, and the standard chemotherapy is pemetrexed and platinum-based, um, you can use cisplatinum or carboplatinum. We prefer carboplatinum because um, carboplatinum is easier on the kidneys. Um, and, uh, you know, slightly better protocol. Cisplatin may work a little better, but um, not much. It's like, you know, maybe 1 or 2%, and it has more side effects that it can really damage your kidneys. Mm. So most doctors use carboplatin. Um, some will use cisplatin. So when you combine pe uh, uh, pembrolizumab and pemetrexed with a platinum drug. Mm -hmm. um, so the survival difference compared to standard chemotherapy is 22 months overall survival versus 10 months. Wow. This is metastatic patients. Wow. Um, then there's another study called the IM Power 131, and this is used as another uh, third generation PD1 inhibitor called atezolizumab. And they combine that with chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone as a first line for stage four uh, squamous. This is for squamous, not for adenocarcinoma. Um, Keynote 189 protocol is, is only for non-squamous, okay. and so this was actually for squamous. Um, and uh, the survival difference was uh, is 23.4 months overall survival average uh, versus 10 for chemotherapy. Okay, and these are again are for late stage? Um, they're for advanced okay. first line. Okay. So that's the difference. So mm -hmm. these are patients that are going to have a really poor response because they're stage four, as soon as they're diagnosed, it's in all their organs, not all, but you know, many organs, um, mm -hmm. but it's their first treatment. Okay. Um, and then there's a Checkmate 227, and that should give you an indication of how many Checkmate studies have been out yeah. there. Checkmate um, is, is for nivolumab, um, and this is also first line. And so in this one, um, they combined nivolumab, which is a P the first generation PD-1 inhibitor, uh, with ipilimumab, which is a CTLA-4 inhibitor that we discussed last week. And um, that's another form of immunotherapy, ipilimumab. And so the uh, overall survival, the average medium, 
was 17 months versus 13.9 for the chemo. However, um, when you look at the statistics, things panned out a little differently. Mm. So um, the overall was 23 months for nivolumab and ipilimumab combination versus 15 for nivolumab alone. Mm. And then the two-year survival rate was 40% um, uh, um, for, uh, for the combination, the two drugs together, and 33 for, uh, I believe it was the one drug. Mm. And then the progression-free survival um, was 23.2 months um, versus 6.2 months wow. for, for the chemotherapy. Mm. Right. Wow. So adding in, uh, was, that, was that for the combination, the new volume? Yeah, so they, they, they did. Um, the point was what they wanted to do is they wanted to compare single agent to adding the CTLA4 inhibitor. Mm, got it. So they compared the two together. Right, and it gave people a lot more time. Big difference by adding ipilimumab, yeah. yes. So now we know, add ipilimumab with your PD-1 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so uh, that's about it. Um, I could go Holy on cow. and on and on, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to cover our new faves. So those are our new three faves. The Keynote 189 protocol, the uh, IM Power 131, and the Checkmate 227. Okay. Good those know. are those are the ones okay. we would be suggesting right now. What's important if you're if you're watching this video uh, at any point, uh, even a month down the road from now, um, while this information will still be true, there's almost certainly going to be some new information oh, so as much. well. And just today, uh, there's so much information. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot of people mm -hmm. making PD-1 inhibitors now. So this is CTLA really inspiring. If you have lung cancer, there's so much that you can do. People, they're, they're, depending on the genetics, the the molecular drivers of your cancer, yeah. there's, uh, I, I mean, I'm still floored by that one study you were talking about. With the KRAS inhibitor. With the, yeah, yeah like a hundred percent, wow. For yeah. Wow, I'm just really... That's a disease control rate. That. So the disease control rate is all three responses together. Right. It's... Um, 56% yeah, had it's an high. outrageously amazing response yes. if they had that one genetic yeah. target. So just, just, just to be clear, the disease control rate includes a complete response, a partial response, and a stable disease because they're three different responders. I understand. Okay, but I'm still excited. Yes, you, can't, me too. you can't stop me, me too. from being excited. No, there. There's some too. really, you know, from a, a cancer that used to be really, yes. you know, exceptionally deadly and scary. This is really exciting for people, especially what you were talking about earlier about some folks who were, um, you know, very late stage had already tried three mm -hmm. or four different types mm -hmm. uh, of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just adding certain things, modifying certain things, and knowing what genes are driving exactly. your cancer has given them years more life. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching Seatome TV. Subscribe below and stay informed.